So Tom, let me, let me circle back with you. Um, you know, clearly we have a lot of agents in kidney cancer in 2015. We have tyrosine kinase inhibitors like sunitinib and, and uh, pazopinib. So the obvious question is, are these checkpoint inhibitors combinable? And, and some efforts have been put into combining it, and the results are not exactly as we had hoped for. Your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I think always we want to take active drugs and try to combine them. In kidney cancer in general and in, in other tumor types, trying to take agents and combine can sometimes be fraught with difficulties, especially in toxicity. And what's tended to happen in kidney cancer when we've taken our current approved drugs, which are generally in two classes, VEGF-related drugs and mTOR-related drugs, and tried to combine them together, we've come across overlapping toxicities that have resulted in lowering the, um, the effective dose of the drugs to the point that they just didn't work in combination. Now that we have a new potential mechanism of action, potential different side effect profile, different dose limiting toxicities, um, we can potentially combine them together. That's, that's the hope. Now we've, we've done some early studies and there are some toxicity concerns um, that, that, for instance, hepatotoxicity would be one that has led it uh, difficulty in combining some particular VEGF inhibitors with um, the PD-1 and PD-L1 drugs. The one thing I wanted just to bring up and, and throw this back at Dave, which in his opinion, is um, what's nice about the immune-based therapies is it's not histology dependent. There's no reason to think that a histologic subtype of kidney cancer would necessarily respond less mm -hmm. than the clear cell. And what we've seen in the current drugs we have, not speaking about mTOR inhibitors, which may indeed have a role for non-clear cell histologies, but speaking about VEGF inhibitors, which are predominantly aimed at clear cell histologies, which have a HIF-dependent mechanism, these um, PD-1 and PD-L1 drugs, immuno drugs, should be potentially active in all histologies. And I think that's I think that's something we'll come back to and circle back to when we talk about non-clear cell histologies. But but Eric, let, let me just um, set the stage for our, for our viewers because we have some pivotal trials, right? We have a pivotal trial with nivolumab versus Everlimus. Um, we have a pivotal trial in the frontline setting with both nivolumab as well as molecules like MDL uh, 3280. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the, the, the phase three pivotal trial compared to Everlimus. Kind of what's the setting, the comparative group, and, and what your expectations are when we might see some outcomes from that. So this is a, a large study. This is a follow-up study to, to the studies that I, I talked about before, and it's the logical extension. So this is a trial in individuals have previously received systemic therapy and have progressed on systemic therapy with renal cell carcinoma. And this is a large randomized study randomizing individuals between nivolumab and everolimus. Now the primary endpoint of this trial is overall survival. And so that makes it very interesting because it's quite different from a lot of the other trials that have been done in, renal, in the renal cell carcinoma arena where progression-free survival has been the, the primary endpoint. And so what we're expecting is that these profound and prolonged responses that we've seen in a subset of individuals might be borne out in this situation and we might actually see uh, a, a prolongation of pro overall survival. With regards to the, the readout of this study, we're anticipating that this should be happening within the next six months or so. So we're obviously extremely excited, and if this were to be positive, this would be the first immuno or new immuno-oncology agent in the renal cell carcinoma arena. So take the next extension, David, and that is that although we don't know the results of the trial, we have to wait for the, for the critical data and opportunity to review but clearly one of the things that the practicing oncologist is going to want to know is when do I use it? And the pivotal trial is in second line setting compared to an mTOR inhibitor. If you were making a recommendation of how they should think about when to deliver it, what would be your thoughts and how would you instruct them? Well, I have a somewhat biased view on this subject, um, doing years of IL-2 based therapy for my patients. And in general, for immunotherapies, we often want to offer them early in the, case, in the situation because there, as we've talked about several times, is a small chance of a durable remission, which would then preclude the need for subsequent treatments. And we also know that our TKIs salvage immunotherapy failures well. Um, so that you, people have good options to fall back on. And we've seen encouraging median survivals when we've do, done that sequence of immunotherapy first followed by TKIs. But in this case, we're missing the data. So all the data that, that Eric has described is in treatment failures. Um, there's very limited 
data in untreated patients. So while, while I would want to move early to bring PD-1 up front if it got FDA approved, I, I'd like to see a little bit more data. Um, and, it, and it may be that, um, you know, we're not ready to jump in right away. And that's, you know, that's why we have to wait for some of these frontline trials where we're looking at combinations in untreated patients. You know, and, and it may be that it, we, it takes a while to get an approval for a single agent PD-1 in the frontline in kidney cancer. It's probably going to be hard to do without a biomarker that tells us who should be treated in that setting. And we're, we're several years away from a predictive marker. And I think, and I think <coughs> we, we have you know, two large phase three trials at least, asking and answer, hopefully answering that question. You know, we have uh, Ipinevo compared to sunitinib in the previously untreated metastatic population. And we have MD, MPDL 3280 plus BEV uh, versus sunitinib uh, plus MPDL uh, 3280 in the upfront situation using a different molecule. So what I'm hearing, uh, Eric and, and Tom, is that absent some granular data in the upfront setting, that even if checkpoint inhibitors were approved in kidney cancer, you would be reserving the therapy primarily for uh, where the trials have demonstrated efficacy. Tom? Well, I think absolutely. And one of the points that, that we didn't yet breach is, is how the phase two data looks in regards to how patients respond to their checkpoint inhibitor. Um, we need to understand the natural history of the treatment with the checkpoint inhibitor. It seems like there is a delay sometimes in achieving a response. There can be what people have called a pseudo progression before there is a response. So the using an immune drug is going to be a different expectation in immediate benefits to the patient, whether that be a, a PFS type benefit or a response rate benefit, than what we may traditionally have come to expect when we use a VEGFTKI, where it can be very robust tumor shrinkage and response rate early. So I'd really want to massage and understand this natural history of treatment, what it looks like for the patient so, before I apply it first line. So let, let's dive into that for a couple of moments. Tell us what pseudoprogression is, how you interpret it, what you do with that information, and also broaden that a little bit with respect to the toxicity profiles from checkpoint inhibitors that we've seen in kidney cancer. Tom? Oh, you give me the tough question, so I guess I bring the topic up, I uh, face, face, the, face the question. Um, so pseudoprogression is going to be small amounts of growth, generally not, cons generally not significant flares of progression, but small amount of growth that are happening over the few months it takes for the immune system response to be generated from the therapy. And, and one has to treat through that um, sometimes to see the benefit. So that's the pseudo progression. Because why it's called pseudo is because ultimately patients do respond and it comes back down. So it's just a little bit of increase in, in, in growth of tumor before we see, we see the decline. Now, toxicity um, is a whole other area. And, and certainly when one stimulates the immune system, one takes the break off of the immune system, the activated T cells then can, can sometimes attack normal, normal host cells. And, and that can be in particular organs that we've seen um, we've seen that in the GI tract causing a diarrhea onus, a colitis. We've seen that in the adrenal gland. We've actually even seen it in the pituitary gland. Um, those are no noteworthy. And I think Eric mentioned the lungs as pneumonitis as a toxicity too. So those are probably the most profound um, side effects of, of activation with a, a checkpoint inhibitor. So David, I want to I wanna just nail this down for our, for our audience. Um, if a person's treated with a checkpoint inhibitor, and has some, some growth in existing disease, right. is that different than a person who is treated with a checkpoint inhibitor and develops new disease? Can you have pseudo progression with the appearance of new disease in other areas? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's confusing for clinicians to separate what's actually going on because most times when you see new lesions, even in these patients, it's real progression. It's not pseudo. But occasionally you'll see new lesions and we, early on in the development of these agents, we struggled. We often pulled them off treatment uh, probably too soon. We took patients to the operating room for, say, new brain metastases, only to find that those brain lesions were actually dead 
tumor. Right. And, and the, the progression is really a reflection of the immune infiltrate making a tumor look bigger or making a tumor appear that was not apparent before. You can now see it on a scan. So when a clinician is faced with this, you have to make a decision that's more based on art than science, essentially. You have to look at the patient, have a conversation, see how they're feeling. In general, if a patient is feeling the same or better, it's easy to treat through and say, well, maybe we'll do another follow-up scan in a short interval and see, a, and see an improvement. The harder thing is when you see new disease and the patient doesn't look so good. And there you have to be ready to move on because oftentimes that confirmatory scan will show a, more progression and you have to be ready to salvage the, the situation with the new therapy. Eric, your thoughts about this? Yeah, I totally agree. I think we, we don't know yet how to measure benefit uh, with these agents. And the other thing I wanted to go back to with what Tom was saying is I totally agree. At this point in time, it's easy to, to say if it works well in the second line setting, it's going to even work even better in the front line setting. But we don't know how, for example, the tumor is being conditioned by previous treatment. We just right. published some data recently showing that with anti-angiogenic therapy, this actually can upregulate PDL1 right. in tumors. So it could be that, that there's new strategies that will develop over the next five to 10 years where we come in with a particular drug to prepare the, the body to be able to benefit even better from checkpoint therapy. So if the data, and we hope the data are gonna be positive for the second line study, that's great. But that doesn't guarantee that this is gonna be as effective in the frontline setting. And we have studies that are gonna answer that question.